to ask a question. And I want us to reflect on that particular question. And that's going to be our subject or our title tonight. My question is, where is my strength? Where is my strength? You know, if you are, you are a strong person, and you have built a reputation as a strong person, and you know that you have what it takes to display or to defend the strength you, you claim to have, and yet every time you get into battles or you get into conflict or you get into uh, a challenge that whereby there is a demand on that particular strength you have. But if you keep on being defeated, then you wonder, where is my strength? Amen? So you say you have all these strengths, and everybody knows, and you know that you have that, that strength, but if you get defeated, you, you're being beaten, you're being overthrown, you're being trodden down, and then now and then you ask, but well, where is that particular strength? So what am I saying? What I'm saying is like, is like you are so rich, and you, are, you have so, you are, so rich, you are so wealthy, and you have all this money in your bank account, or someone left you in inheritance. Yes, here you are in crisis. Here you are, you can't pay your bills. Here you are, you can't look after your children. Here you are, you are, you are stranded, and you don't know how to, to clear the ch financial challenges you have. But yet you say, I'm very wealthy and my bank is so full. Now and then you are going to wonder, where is my finances? Why? Because your reality does not equate what you claim to possess. So what I'm saying is like when you say, okay, uh, I have a healer in my life. And this healer can heal any kind of sickness and disease. And he heals it supernaturally. And then here you are, you are dealing with a sickness, you are dealing with a disease, you are dealing with a challenge, and you are not able to clear or to defeat that particular challenge you have in your health. Yet you claim to have a special physician who can heal or can clean, who can heal and cure any kind of sickness or disease. Then in that place, you yourself, you put in question that particular physician or you put in question the reality of the physician you claim to have that you can clear or heal any kind of sickness and diseases. So what I'm trying to tell us is like, we just want to reflect on this question. Where is my strength? Maybe you're dealing with a situation right now. You feel like, okay, um, uh, you know, I need God to provide for me. Then where is my provision? I want God to to heal me. Where is my healing? I want God to give me direction. Where is direction? All sort of things that we all come to the particular place where we begin to ask questions because we feel like we are being denied access to answers. You know, in the book of uh, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 39, I'll start from here tonight. The Bible says, and I'm weak today, though anointed, and these men, the son of Zeruiah, are too harsh for me. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. Now I want us to look at the first part of that particular scripture. David said, I am weak today, though anointed. Look at that. He said, I'm weak, though anointed. Now I want us to understand the anointing is, is meant for our, it was meant for the strength of those who are called. The anointing increases value. The anointing increases might. The anointing increases the ability. It means that when the anointing of God comes on a particular person, they are able to go in a realm that they could never go with their own strength or with their own ability. Now, if you have the anointing, you are able to achieve what you could not achieve your own personal strength. You are able to think at the level you could not think of based on, all, on your own mind because the anointing 
is divine ability on a person that empowers him for exploit. It's really a highway to a life of quank, a conquest, conquest, a life that is unparalleled, a life that is uncommon, a life that is beyond mere just common men and women. But here David is saying, I'm anointed, yet I am weak. Another word, I have what can make me strong, but there is no manifestation for the strength that the anointing can provide. Is it not like a con contradiction? I mean, if you are anointed, then you have to be strong. But he's saying, I'm anointed, but I'm weak. So the question is, what is causing that? Why is it such a confusion? Why is it such a contrast in David's life? Because we know the anointing has to propel you. The anointing has to catapult you to, catapult you to another level, to another dimension. Yet, you are anointed, you are still grounded. You are anointed. Now, that puts that particular anointing in the question. Anointing is a powerful thing. I think all of us who are anointed by God, every child of God, you are anointed because you have the Holy Spirit on inside of you. And I want you to know there are great things that can happen to a person who loves the anointing when they are anointed. Now, I want us just in passing, because this is not the subject of anointing, but we are talking about where is my strength. That's really where I'm going to focus on. But talking about the anointing, I just want us to look at the five things really quickly that can happen to a person when they are anointed. And then you can find more, but I just want to draw five things. And these things, I've, I've drawn them from the life of uh, Samuel. If you read the book of Samuel, chapter number 10, verse 2 to 7. Now, I will encourage you when, during your own personal time, your Bible study, you can start from chapter 9 and then go chapter 10 so you can have really the, the full uh, uh, idea and the history behind uh, what you, you are reading. But in particular, uh, uh, chapter 10, we see Saul who was anointed by Samuel. And I want us to know these few things that happened to Saul after he was anointed. And these are the things that happens to people who are really anointed. When you are anointed, the first thing that happened to you there is a recovery of what was lost. It means that when you lost years, you lost, uh, I don't know, resources, you lost time, you lost, the anointing comes and begins. For instance, when God tells us, you, you're going to restore to us the years the canker worm have eaten, how can you? recover the years because these years already lost if you wasted let's say 10 years 40 years but god has promised that i'm going to restore the years the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten from you how would that be possible because through the anointing because through the anointing there is a recovery of what was lost there's a recovery of what was even you know the the, the wasted years the wasted time of your life. And we see this exactly in the life of Saul. He lost the donkey. And when he was anointed, he began to go. Samuel, Samuel said to him, I mean, if you, as you are going, I want you to know that the, the donkeys are already found. But when the amazing thing, when you begin to study uh, the life of Saul in regard to the anointing, you notice the Bible says, when you come to Rachel's tomb, is it a coincidence? Like the, the men who came to tell Saul that the donkeys that your father lost, they are found. So your father is no longer worrying about the donkeys, worrying about you. It was a Rachel tomb. Why is it Rachel tomb? Well, Rachel tomb, a tomb is a place of the dead where people are buried, where there is no memory, there is no history. So what God is telling us is that when the anointing of God comes to your life, what happened? Even dead places, God begin, God begin to bring uh, increase. God begin to prosper you in places whereby they say it will never happen. You can go 
to a place whereby they say here people don't get jobs or here people don't build churches or here, whatever is the case. But when the anointing of God is over a person, that particular person begins not only to recover that which was lost, it also able to begin to increase in the area, the dead land, dead ground, dead businesses, dead opportunity. Why? Because the anointing of God is the ability to bring life away. Uh, there is death. You know, that's what we see in the lives of even the forefathers. For instance, you find the, uh, Isaac in, in Genesis chapter 26. Isaac, God said to him, I mean, everyone was leaving the land because there was famine in the land. And it's, it's common sense. When things are not working, you know, the business is not working, things are not working. I mean, you will say, no, I want to leave. But God said to him, don't leave, stay here. You see, every father who accounted God, who is the, the source of all anointing, they were able to prosper, they are able to recover, they are able to, to do exploit, even in places where, where it was not humanly possible to do that. And we see Isaac, Isaac, our father, you know, he, he was digging wells of, of his father, uh, Abraham. And you find out when he, he dug a well, and the, the, the Philistine would come to the quarrel over the land. Either they took the land, the well, sorry, they took the well, or they, put, they fill it with, 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 with soil or sand, and then he would go somewhere else. So wherever he went, he dug a well, and the water just gushed out. Why? Because the favor, because of the presence of God. So I want us to understand. Now remember, this is not really the full teaching on the anointing. I'm just giving us few things because of the scriptures are called to us. So the first thing you need to understand when you're really anointed by God is that you will you recover what you was lost. You know, and you have to understand that you might feel like I've lost a wasted time in this and that. Even when you were in the world, God will restore to you whatever that's what I always tell us. Whatever leaves your hand, never leave your life. The anointing is a greater recoverer, if I can put it that way. Glory to God. The second thing that happens to you when you're real anointed is supernatural progress. Supernatural progress. Remember when he came to the Rachel tomb. Now, the Rachel tomb is a place of the dead. And some of us say, Apostle, is, remember tomb again is place of the dead. You know, no, no activity. Nothing's happening. And some of us say, Apostle, I've been here way too long. I've been doing this business way too long. I've been doing the church way too long. I feel I'm stuck here. Nothing's happening. I want you to know, the Bible says when he was in Rachel's tomb, the Bible says he went forward from there. Notice he was no stuck. You know, every time when we're in the place of the dead, everybody's stuck. Nothing is happening in the country. Nothing happening in my family. Nothing happening in my business. Nothing happening in my church. We are just stuck. No, it's not like that. When the anointing comes supernaturally, it brings you. You begin to go forward. How are you going to happen? You won't know how that's going to, to take place. You won't even be able to understand why. Because the anointing has the ability to bring you forward. The third thing I want us to quickly to understand when the anointing of God comes over your life is that the anointing of God we connect with people who carry the presence of God. Remember the Bible says when he came to that particular place, he, he came to, to the garrison, uh, the place, the garrison of the Philistine, where their soldier were, he met a company of people who came from Bethel. And uh, Bethel means the house of God or the presence of God. If you're really anointed by God, it's not about, you know, having this or having that. But the anointing of God has the ability to carry you in a place where you're going to meet men of God who are also, who love the presence of God because the anointing of God feeds on the presence of God. And the anointing of God, he preserves by the presence of God. So the anointing itself is the ability, as you allow the Holy Spirit to carry you, to, to bring you to places whereby you meet men, you meet women, you meet daughters, sons and daughters who really love the presence of God and you build your own company. That's why what we should, we should treasure really when it comes to God, it is his, his, the Holy Spirit and the anointing that he brings in our lives. Because that anointing has the ability to do more in our life that we are able to do. And the Bible said the fourth thing very quick I want us to understand when you really have the anointing of God is that the anointing of God will bring divine favor. Now, remember, this is not the teaching of the anointing. I'm just showing us a few things 
but you can read the chapter. It's going to help you. The Bible says when he came to that place, he found this man. This man brought to Saul bread and wine. And something, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll notice that Saul did not go, uh, he did not go begging. He did not go asking, oh, please help me. And you know, when you are really anointed by God, you are not a beggar. You're not living at the mercy of others. And he was there, and people came. The Bible said they gave him wine. They gave him bread, which is favor. I mean, there is something that, 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 that comes over your life when the anointing comes, whereby people begin to favor you. At work, people favor you. In your community, people favor you. You start a business, and you are wondering, how am I going to get this contract, that contract? And people can bring their tender. And when you show up, you are able to get a contract. You are wondering, oh, my God, I even fell short. But because the anointing of God brings favor over your life. And the last thing, really, I want us to know, the fifth thing I want us to understand, when the anointing of God comes over your life, the anointing transforms you. And this one really put uh, some time, uh, we put in question sometimes people who claim to be anointed but don't live the life that is expected by Christ who is the anointer. <laughs> I don't know if I say that. So Christ is the one who anoints us. He's a holy Christ. He has the Holy Spirit. And when he anoints us and he sends us on a mission, that anointing that we, we, we are using to bless others, to heal others, to deliver others, the same anointing is also able to change our lives. So we cannot say, okay, I'm anointed by God, but that same anointing can't deliver me from lust. We are anointed by God, that same anointing just casting out demons, prophesying, healing the sick, but can't, uh, can't deliver me from gossip, can't deliver me from lies. No, there's something that happens to a person when they anoint, they're anointed. The anointing of God. When we allow the Holy Spirit to come in our lives, the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to transform our lives. The Bible says what happened to Saul. When he came to that particular place, he found a company of prophets. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him. He began to prophesy and was turned to another man. What a prayer to pray. It means that God is able to turn you into another woman. God is able to turn you into another man. You, you can say, me, I'm so weak. I can't pray. I can't fast. I can't preach. I can't do whatever you feel you can't do. But let me tell you, when the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes over your life, that anointing has the ability and the propensity to transform you, to turn you into a wild, crazy girl of the kingdom where the fire of God begin to flow over your life, where boldness come. You might have been shy, oh, you know, me, I'm so timid, I'm, I'm so that, but when the anointing comes over your life, remember, remember Peter, the same Peter was afraid of a woman denied Jesus, the same disciples were, were afraid of the Jews, they were hiding themselves, but the day the Holy Ghost came, the anointing hit them, they were so bold, they declared, Clear the word of Jesus with boldness. And the Bible said they fill the whole city with the teaching of Jesus. Was Because of the anointing. So what I'm trying to tell us, here now we see there's a big contrast or the big difference. David said, I'm anointed, yet I'm weak. Now that becomes a question because we are trying to find out, even for yourself, you're trying to say, okay, where is my strength then? Where is my anointing? Why my anointing is not working? Why the things that God has spoken to me is not working? David, how come then you are anointed, but we can't see the result that we see, in, we, saw, we see in the life of Saul? We see Saul receive the anointing, and this thing happened. But we, you say you receive the anointing, but we don't see you are saying something totally different. I want us to understand these people of God. Jesus inside of you and me is very powerful. Is very strong. In fact, the Bible says you can do all things through Christ. It means through the, the Jesus who is inside of you, you can do exploit. I mean, you can change communities, 
you can you can change countries you can influence nations you can do things that your family member have never been able to do when you just depend on christ of inside of you because the bible says greater is he who is inside of you than he who is in the world so inside of you there is strength inside of you there is ability but if now you are going to be strong remember we are asking so where is my strength your strength is not in what you do or in in your ability to do something it's not in your performance your strength my strength is not in our prayers it's not in your fasting it's not in your giving it's not in your connection it's not in anything you can do so when we are asking where is my strength then we have to say to ourselves it's not really about where is my strength but rather, how is my connection with Jesus? Because Jesus is the source of our strength. So when we are talking about strength, we are talking about positioning myself in the center of Jesus' will and allowing and beginning to allow Jesus to live his life through me. And that's what we call the supernatural life. What is the supernatural life? Because you are natural, but when Jesus comes on top of you, because Jesus is supernatural, and then when you allow him to work, and people begin to wonder, what is going on with her? What is going on with him? No, it is, you are just the simple John, the simple James, but you have, a, you have submitted yourself under the will of the Father, and the Father has taken preeminence, and is able to take you where you could, never take, you could have never taken yourself. So I want us to understand that we are strong in Jesus. We are strong in the Lord. So when we are talking about our strength, our strength is in the Lord. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. So we have to be strong in the Lord. So we are, we are strong through the Lord. So when now we do not take care of our relationship with the Lord, then we, even though we are anointed, just like David, then you begin to wonder where is the result of the anointing? Because the source of the anointing is no longer there. Or the source of the anointing, we do not have a proper relationship with him, and that has handicapped or have, has, has brought us in a place where we are not able to enjoy the fullness of what the anointing can bring. You know, when I talk about this, it reminds me of Samson. Remember, Samson was a man with a supernatural strength. I mean, a man who shocked uh, the known world. In their time, they were shocked of his strength. It was God who manifested himself according to the covenant of might, or the covenant of strength in the life of Samson. You notice even when uh, his, uh, that woman Delilah came to deceive Samson, uh, lied to Samson, you know what happened? He said, he was asking Samson, where is the secret of your strength? In other words, Samson was just a common man. A common man just like, like some of us. But when this man will just be ticked off, that when he snaps, the man, the Bible says, when I get the, the jaw bones of a donkey, he will kill thousands of people with it. I mean, a man will snap, he will take, he will, he will rip off the, the city gate. I mean, can you imagine those days they used to have those huge the gate built of bronze. He would put it on his back and he's climbing on the hill. And the people look at, where is his strength from there? They look at the person, he's just a normal person, he's just in a casual guy. But this guy, what he's doing is beyond him because it was the strength of God working in him. And when what happened when Samson disconnected himself from God? He lost that strength. You see? So when we are talking about where is my strength, we have really to begin to, to look at uh, how is my relationship with the Lord Jesus? Am I still in connection with God? Am I still doing the things that are pleasing God. You know, in Judges chapter 16, verse 20, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at the other times and shake myself free. But I did not know that the Lord had departed from him. 
my God. You know, when I read this, I said, Lord, quite a shocking thing. So he was living euphoria, in illusion. He just knew, you know what? I got to stop. He knows, you know, I'm just going to shake myself. When I just shake myself, I mean, I'm going to get this guy. So what happened now? He violated the secret of the covenant. He violated what gave him strength. He did not walk according to the, the covenant that he had with God as far as his strength was concerned. But he still wanted to enjoy the benefit of the covenant. And most of us, we are like that. You know, you know you, we are not doing what God wants us to do. We are not doing the thing God expects from us. But yet we want to see the hand of God of our life. And when it does not happen, we question God, why is it happening? No, that's what happened to Samson. The Bible says he shook himself. And what did he show him to me? He said, the Bible says, he knew not that the law departed from him. In other words, when God leaves, he does not give you a warning. When we are messing around, you and the, 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 the shocking thing sometimes with God, at least in Samson, Samson realizes, he didn't realize, I don't know, maybe let's say it was five years, ten years, God left him. And he started walking around the illusion. And then, you know, I still have God. Then when the circumstances uh, just uh, arose, then you realize, oh my God, I don't have God. God left me a long time, you know. And like I've always said, you know, uh, God is the only boss who can fire you, but keeps you working and keeps paying you. You know, in a normal job, if you are fired, you are fired. You know, in our part of the world, when they fire you, sometimes they, you when you're casual, they, they don't like you anymore. They're just going to come up with something. They say something like, oh, John, you know me, this day business are really down. And we just want to, we'll call you back. You know, we really want to work, work in a few things, some new contract. This, you, you are getting fired <laughs> right there. I mean, they call, they will never call you back. In fact, they, that's a polite way in Australia we tell you, you are fired. You know, we are not like American. We tell you, you are fired. Here we tell you, you know, we call you back. We really, the contract are low. And next time you call them, you know, or they, they don't pick up your call. They, then you say, I'll just leave a message. And three times, four times, you know that, you know what? I have to move on with my life. So, but at least that, in, you know, you, in that way, you know that you are fired. But God is not like that. God can keep you working, but you are fired. You're getting paid, you're fine. And that's, that's the illusion of people sometimes. You are not pleasing God, but you're still operating in a gift. You're still casting out demons, you can still can prophesy, you can see in the realm of the spirit, because these are gifts. And the Bible says the gift and the calling are re irrevocable. It means that it, without repentance. It means that one, God, once God gives you a gift, he does not take it back. He leaves you with it. You can even, I've seen, anyway, I don't want to go there, but people who really live terrible life and they come, they prophesy, they cast out demons. And you wonder how come? Because they're operating in a gift. That person is already fired by keep on working. Because, you see, God will do it for the sake of his people. I mean, if God gives you a gift, you're not living right. God knows, you know, because God loves people, you know, someone needs a healing. He's still going to use you. Someone needs prophecy. He's still going to use you. But because God is using it, that's not me, God endorses what you are doing. So we have to be very, very careful. That happened with Saul. Saul was rejected by God. But guess what? He was still a king a few years after that. Rejected by still ruling. And he had access to all the privileges the king had. He still had an army around him. He still had a chariot around him. He had a, a kingly protocol. He had, you know, all these uh, prophets around him. But the guy was rejected. So he was fired, he was still on duty. And we need to understand that see, if we really want to see the strength of God, we have to be checking on our relationship with God on a daily basis. We don't want to live, especially in these days, in a place whereby we don't know, you're just going with the, mo uh, with the motion, as we say, you know, if you're a pastor, keep on preaching, and if you are whatever, you keep on doing. But it's a time of us uh, to ask yourself, well, I don't, where is my strength? I don't feel the anointing of God. I don't see the presence of God. I don't see the manifestation of the gift. Therefore, how is my relationship with Jesus? And the good thing with God is that you can always come back to him 
you can always mend your relationship with him. Now, very quickly, I want us to look at the strength robbers. Remember, I'm talking about where is my strength. What are the things that can really rob us of our strength? Remember, I said again, you are strong in the Lord. You, you have Jesus on inside of you. Because Jesus is inside of you, you are already strong. The Bible says with the Lord, we can do what we can do, exploit. With the Lord, we can crush the enemy under our feet. But now there are things that can rob us from that particular strength, meaning there are things that can compromise our relationship with God to the place whereby we, we start getting weaker. We don't function the way we used to function before. You don't feel the anointing of God. You feel like you are, you are Samson. You're shaking yourself, but nothing is happening. You're screaming, but nothing is happening. But you knew before, when you're in covenant, Samson, just, you just have to stand up. You, you take like all the, you take the, I don't know, foxes. You tie them up. You put fire on them, and things are happening. But why things are not happening? Sometimes we have to look at what I call strength robbers. I have a, how many strength robbers? I got six things that can rob our strength. I want us to look at it very quickly. The first thing that robs us of our strength is sin. Genesis 49, verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defile it. He went up to my couch. I want us to know this. That the Bible said Reuben is the beginning of strength. Reuben was, was endowed with strength. Reuben was qualified to have the strength of, of his father. Why? Because he's the firstborn. And then his father said, even though you are qualified for strength, you are not going to enjoy that strength. Why? Because you defile my bed. We know what happened to Reuben. He went to, I think he slept with Bela, his father's wife. So what I'm trying to make us understand is that when we compromise the established principle of the father, what happened? We begin to disqualify ourselves from the blessing of strength that the father has made available to us. And that thing comes through sin. When we begin to live sinful lifestyle, sin opens up the door. Like I've always said, sin is a, is, a, is a bridge that the enemy travels on to have access in our life. I will never over, over, emphasize this enough. You know, I know we all talk about grace, this and grace, that. But before we talk about grace, we need to understand the reason we're talking about grace is because we fell unto sin. And grace is not licensed to sin, but grace is an empowerment for righteousness. So when Jesus came, he came through the Holy Spirit to empower us to live the life that God is expecting from us. In fact, when it comes to walking in the holiness, walking in our righteousness in Christ, the Bible says, we, in, we believe in Romans chapter 6, we should reckon ourselves dead. We should consider ourselves dead so we can allow God to live his life through us. That's the only way we can live a holy life. So I want us to understand sin robs us of the is a first strength robber. In Judges 3.12, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they have done evil in the sight of the Lord. I want us to understand that when we engage a lifestyle of sin, we are empowering the enemy to have victory over our lives. The Bible says that when the children of Israel did evil, God is strengthened. In other words, when we do evil, we compromise what God wants us to do. We are empowering the enemy against ourselves. And we begin to wonder, God, why, why my life is like this? What's happening? You know, it's not like why your life is like that. You have given the devil license. You have empowered the devil through sinful lifestyle to have victory over your life. Now, I want us to understand, we can't say we, we are always perfect and we are all alone. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we, we make God a liar and this word is not in us. But we need to understand there's a difference. Someone who, you know, who fell into sin and someone's living a sinful lifestyle. 
sinful lifestyle is like a pig, like we always say, you know, the pig, when he, he falls in, he falls in the um, uh, dirty water, can just a pig, that's my life. I'm in the zone, I mean, like, this is me. This is my natural habitat. That's a pig. I mean, he loves the mud. But you notice when, when a lamb falls in the mud, the lamb is crying, oh, my God, he's crying, man, help me, man. And I wait, I'm stuck in this mud. I don't like it, you know. So what I'm trying to say that we should, when we know we have fallen, we have to stand our eyes for forgiveness, trust God for strength, and keep on going in the direction God wants you to go which is the direction of holiness and righteousness. Glory to God. The second thing I want us to know that can really rob our, our strength is wasting our strength. We can waste the strength God has given us. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 20, and your, your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. So there's no fruitfulness. Why? Because the strength is spent in vain. Now, when God gives you strength, or God gives you ability, God gives you a gift, God gives you opportunity, God gives you a position, whatever you feel, because the strength of God is not always casting out demons. The strength of God can be financial uh, strength. God can give you the ability to communicate the word or to teach the word. All these are dimensional divine strengths. But for them, for us to profit uh, and, and, and walk in accordance with that particular strength, they have to be invested in the direction that God has given them. What I'm trying to tell us is this. When God has called you to prophesy, then prophesy. If God has called you to sing, then sing. If God has called you to teach the word, teach the word. If God has called you with your finances to, to be a, a sponsor or a kingdom financier, be kingdom financier. If God has called you to in the media, be a media man or media woman. Whatever God has called you to do, it means that you take whatever God has given you. You know this is a weapon that God has put in my hand, and I will, I will go toward the direction of that particular uh, weapon in the service of the kingdom. You know, there are a lot of things that are happening today whereby, yes, I have the strength, yes, I have the gift, Yes, I have the ability. Yes, God has given me this. But you find sometimes people who, we make it all about them. You know, yeah, the gift is working. God has strengthened me, given me this ability. But I want to use it not to be a blessing, uh, um, to be a blessing to the people of God, to help the people of God, to empower the people of God. But I want to use that particular strength or that particular gift, that particular the ability to exploit people, to you know, to, to take advantage of none. That's not what God expects from, uh, from us. Uh, in, in that case, we're going to be wasting our strength because there's no reward. And when we do that, the Bible said that the land won't, what, won't produce. And then what's going to happen? The trees won't yield. And there's no fruitfulness. There's no blessing. There's no generational impact. We will, we will live for a particular season. And before you know it, we quench that which God wanted to do in our lives. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So God has given us that, uh, our, the strength so we can turn back and give that particular strength to him in the service in which he has placed us. Glory to the living God. So the strength of God really is, is for the God lovers. God said, you're going to love him with all your strength. So when you are God lover, God gives you strength so you can be able to serve him in the dimension of called you. The third thing I want us to, to know when it comes to uh, strength or robust, when you, you do not engage, we do not engage in the life of gratitude, it robs us of divine strength. When you do not engage in the life of gratitude, look at this, Exodus 15 verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. Another you notice, the Bible says the Lord is what? My strength and song. Now, when they say song, it's not necessarily talking about sound. It's talking about a lifestyle here. Another word, God gives us strength. And when God gives us strength, God wants us now to be to live a lifestyle of gratitude. It means that you must be grateful on a daily basis on the things that God has made available to you. 
Now, if we are not able to thank God for the little that God has given, what we consider little God has given us, how are we going to increase in his strength? It can be in your gift. Now, God has given a gift, let's say, that, you know, I love talking about the prophetic. Now, God has given a, a call in the prophetic. For, but for the moment, you say, I really want to see during the day. But God has given the ability to dream. And you know me, if I dream, it's just going to be like that. That's already the dimension of the prophetic. But you are not grateful. You are not thanking God for that particular thing you have. You say, I wish I could see during the day. It means that you are robbing yourself of the strength God has given you. So God wants us now to live on a daily basis in a lifestyle of, to develop actually the attitude of gratitude. To be thankful for what God has given us. The Bible says, the Lord is my strength and the song. It means that the strength of God equals the song of God. It means that the life of gratitude means a strength in my life. So when I begin to be thankful, I begin to worship God. I begin to honor God for the strength God has given me. The ability is going to give me. What happened now? It begins to increase. Because we need to understand whatever you feed grows and whatever you starve dies. So God wants us to develop an attitude of gratitude. It does not matter what you don't have, but begin to thank God for that which you have. This reminds me of Jesus. Remember, Jesus, when the disciple came to him, I believe John chapter 6, even Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 15 as well, because Jesus performed the, the miracle of multiplication of bread twice. The bread was not sufficient. The fish was not sufficient. And the disciples were wondering, how are we going to fill such a crowd with so, so, so little? You know, when Jesus, they were complaining, Philip, oh, how are we going to fill this? And the disciples, oh my God, even though we have money, how are we going to fill the crowd? They were all complaining. But Jesus did not complain. When he took the bread, the Bible said he gave thanks. It was that attitude of gratitude that brought about multiplication. So if God has given you a gift, God has given you an ability, a job, a business, or a, a wife, or a husband, whatever, instead of always whinging, oh, my husband is like this, or my wife is like this, my children are like this, you better thank God, you know what? I have a husband. You better thank God, you know what? I have a wife. You better thank God, you know what? I have children. You better thank God, you know what? I have a pastor who loves me, man of God who prays for me. You know, meaning, what I'm trying to tell you, just be great, grateful. And as you begin to be grateful, then God, you are creating the environment for God to begin to increase in your relationship, to increase your relationship, whereby love begins to increase and the blessing begins to increase. But when we come to the place where we are, we are complaining, we are, we are, we are living a life of whining and whinging. When we are doing that, we need to understand in that case, we are robbing ourselves of strength. Because the Bible says, the Lord is my strength and the song. God will never be my strength until he's my song. It means that strength is equal to song. The fourth thing I wanted to understand, that really uh, as we begin to look at them, on, uh, the strength of robots, is that we have to focus on the Lord and the assignment the Lord has given unto us. This is so important. I, I don't know how to overemphasize on this one. The Bible says, I believe, Hebrew chapter 12, fixing your eyes on Jesus, who is the founder and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says we should focus our eyes on Jesus. We are living in a generation where but there is a demand for a particular thing, and everyone is going to have that. You know, and every single person they, they want to be this and uh, either in a ministry, they want to be that, even either in a business. But I want us to understand that when God called you, He's the one who called you first. The pastor didn't call you, your boss didn't call you, people didn't call you, it is Jesus who called you. Then he connects you to men and women. So the first assignment, I have to focus my eyes on Jesus. And we all know the story of Peter. Peter was fine. He was walking fine. But when he took off his eyes of Jesus, what happened? He started sinking. When we start looking at people, you want to be like a brother Joe. You want to be like a, a sister Dorothy. You want to be like, I want to be like. When we start looking around, you're going to sink. And if you want to keep your strength, 
Just focus on what God is, first of all, on the Lord and the assignment the Lord has given unto you. If God called you as an evangelist, be an evangelist. I know there's pressure today. You have to prophesy. You have to send the realm of the spirit. No. God called you as, a, as an evangelist. He's going to speak to you in your own way. You're going to win the soul. And that's what matters. God has called you to be a pastor. And you have only five members in your church. It's okay. You know, pastor those five members and, and just look after them. And if God has called you to be an apostle and to lay the foundation, it's okay. If God has called you to be a prophet and you are not out there, do, whatever God has called you, what I'm trying to tell you, just every single one of us, we should remain within the calling we receive from the Lord. And I, I believe in the past, I spoke about the curses of not remaining within the call. When God calls you and you don't want to remain, I think I spoke about this in the past, we spoke about leprosy and things like that. So focusing our eyes on Jesus in a, is a key in maintaining strength in our lives. Focusing our lives on the assignment God has given us. Listen, you know, I always look at the assignment God has given us is driving a car. You know, remember when you saw first start driving a car? And you know, first year, the first time you even, you know, you, you drove a car. You thought, especially when the truck is coming behind you, you're feeling, oh my God, it's going to knock me. Oh my God, I'm finished. Your hands are sweating. You are sweating. The truck behind. No, no, the truck, I mean, if he's in the right mind, because, you know, he's not coming for you. You just remain on your lane. And the truck going to pass you. Oh my God, the ambulance. The ambulance is not coming for you. If you're in an ambulance lane, you can change the lane. But it's, you see what I'm trying to tell us? Just remain on your lane. As long as you're on your lane, you'll be fine. Now, this is just a casual example. I know someone can say, but there are people who remain their lane and they are crazy men who came. We understand all that. You know, craziness is everywhere. But what I'm trying to tell us, just remain within the calling. Be faithful in what God has called you to do and focus on Jesus. Look at the Bible saying in Joshua 14, verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war. Both for going out or coming in. Oh my God. The man is 80 years old. Now during the time of inheritance, he wanted to go fight to get a mountain. He said, no, I want to go. Is it Caleb? You want to go uh, get, get a mountain. I mean, what, what's your problem? He, he, he's telling us, listen, when I was 40 years old, the same strength I had when I was 40 years old is the same strength I have today that I'm 80. So what caused Caleb to maintain that particular strength? What caused him to, to still be in the position he was there before? Why? Because he remained within the assignment. He remained within the calling God gave to them. He's among the few people when people start acting crazy in the wilderness, start perverting the ways of the Lord. He's among the few men who just, is, is, there are only two of them, who remain faithful to the Lord. And guess what? Because he remained faithful to the Lord, the ways of the Lord, and the assignment, the assignment was what? We are going to the promised land. And him and Joshua, they are the ones who say, you know what? God said to us, we are going to take over the land. We are going to take over the land. I mean, they did not divert. They did not go left or right for the assignment. They just focus on the assignment. So if we are going not to lose our strength, maintain our strength to the point where, you know, we still carry the fire when we are 80 or 90, you still love your wife. You still love your children. No matter what happens, you have to focus on the assignment God has given you and the load of the assignment. Oh my God, I said, it is today that most of us, you know, we are being uh, easily distracted because of what probably the strength can bring to you, meaning the gift or the opportunity or whatever. And people, sometimes we just lose it. But God wants us know, to be men and women really who are focusing on Jesus. The first thing I want us to know is we're about to finish is that we have to make our years count. 
I mean, in the book of Deuteronomy 33:25, you know that I love this scripture. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze. As your days, so shall your strength be. As your days, so shall your strength be. As your days, so shall your strength be. Now remember, if you are going to be strong, make your years count. I mean, you've been a Christian now for, for about 10 years. You can't just keep on sucking thumbs and, you know, God, I don't know. And, uh, this. No, it's about time what God is telling us. We have, we have to make our years count in the kingdom. They strap. Some of us, you know, we, we, I'm no longer 12, you know, when I gave my life to Jesus. Today I'm far past 12. So what about all these years? I have to make them count in the kingdom. I can't just keep acting when I was 12. You know, when I was, I mean, I've acted like that before. Left and right, always seeking for this, seeking for prophecy, seeking for someone to impart your life. So whenever you're going to come to a place, you know what? I'm content. God called me. God has his grace over my life. I'll keep on pushing until I see that which the Lord apprehended me for. That's what Apostle Paul is telling us. When God called us, he had his hand over our lives. And so we are pursuing God so that we can see the reason why he put his hand over our lives. We are not here to compete with this or compete with that, but make your years count in the kingdom. I mean, you have to ask yourself, you know what? I have been in the kingdom of God now for 20 years. What are the things I've done? Have I even brought someone to Jesus? I mean, if I live today, what am I going to look back and say, you know what? Even I'm gone, at least I've left somebody going to carry the torch. Who are you going to talk? I mean, <laughs> make your years count in the kingdom. Do something crazy for God. You know, and I'm writing a book uh, I'm writing, you know, I'm always writing. So I'm writing this book. I've changed the way to write anyway. So, because now I want to write too many books. So I thought, well, whatever I preach, I write. And when I was writing a book, and uh, the Lord just brought in my mind when I was young, when I would give my life to Jesus, I was about, I was about 12. And when I was 14, I went to a near, a near nearby market, you know, a market there, you know, I was in Africa then. And I started preaching the gospel. And I said to people, give your life to Jesus. Jesus is coming soon. If you don't give your life, you're going to have. I remember mom, they came to tell my mom, oh my God, people crying. Oh, your mom, your son just, they thought I went do, 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 do. And my mom came carry me, you know. And then, uh, you know, my mom is a Christian today. We will laugh about that. I said, oh, you know, my son, I'm really sorry. I did. I mean, we laugh about that. But what happened? I was, you know, I was 12 then. And I've met my, my thing come. You know, I have one of my son. He's a doctor now. He's in Canada. You know, when I t he tells me, he's, I said to him, when did I leave you to lead you to the Lord? He said, yeah, you my spiritual father. I've been looking for you all these years. And, you know, my, my wife and I were talking to him. It's just amazing. I mean, I thought, well, I sometimes you God, you know, at least him and there, there, you know, look at some of you. I said, well, God, you know, what I'm trying to make us, you know, make you his years count. Don't just be the same place you've been. Do something for God. I mean, we see that with the, the disciple of Jesus. John, they started with the confusion, fighting for position, fighting for this. And John came in a place in his life. He said, you know what? I was taken in, a, in a, the, the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. I mean, he was taken in the realm of the spirit. He began to unfold greater mystery. Apostle Paul said, uh, I believe in First Timothy, First Corinthians, I think chapter 18, somewhere there. He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. Now that I'm growing up, I'm putting away childish things. So what I'm trying to make us understand is that if we are going to grow, if we are going to keep our strength, we need to really, we have to begin to make our life count. There are certain things we have to let go. I mean, you, you've known Jesus for a while. You see, oh, you don't know what he did to me. Get over it. Oh, you don't know what she did. Get over it. I mean, you know Jesus. What is that we can tell you about? You know that Jesus forgives and you know that Jesus cleanses and you know God is he, 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 the vengeance belong to God. So why are you keeping for, uh, forgiveness and bitterness? You know like if vengeance belong to God, if I forgive, God going to take care of them. But if I take care of them, then God going to take care of me because I'm in the covenant. He's going to take care of me, not in a good way. So I want us to understand that we have to make our lives count in the kingdom. This really is a challenge. I want you to do something for God. Every day God is giving us, he's making our, he wants our days to count. You want us to listen? 
you know, David, you were you were young. Now you 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 kill Goliath. Now it's time to go take on the the whole army of the Philistines. Keep on growing. You you kill a bear. Now go kill a lion. Now go kill Goliath. Make all the years they must count. You know, when I started, I knew the Lord. I didn't know much. Now I've learned two or three things, and now I have pastors who are listening to me. Now I'm writing books. I'm trying my best. Now I'm teaching you online or whatever is the case. I'm trying my best. So I'm challenging you also, you know. If you're going to go in the strength of God, you need to make your life and your years and your life count. The last thing I want us to, to, to look at is we are talking about the, the strength of robbers is that if we are going to maintain our strength and come against what's going to rob our lives, we have to engage in warfare. Haggai chapter 2.22 I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentiles kingdom. I will overthrow the chariot of those who ride in them. Their horses, the horses and their riders shall come down everyone by the sword of his brother. Now here God is trying to establish his people. How is he going to establish people? He's not going to sit down there. You know, he said, for me to establish my people, I have to make sure I weaken the strength of nations. I weaken the strength of kingdom. So what I'm trying to tell us is this. If I want to walk in the strength of God, I need to know that there is a kingdom, a kingdom of darkness that is against my life. Now remember the Bible talks about no weapon formed against you. So there are weapons that are formed against you. The devil has thousands of weapons. He knows that if I throw this, he's going to lose balance in his uh, finances. If he knows how we act. So what are we going to do? We have also to, to, to be ready. We have to be geared up in terms of fighting the good fight of faith. And we need to understand this is not fun faith. This is a warfare. I mean, we need to understand the kingdom of God is a kingdom of, of, of that demands strength. The, the kingdom that demands, you know, fighting and the enemy is going to come against us. But the Lord who has given us a victory is going to keep us through. So what I'm trying to tell us is that there is an enemy who wants to see us weak. There is an enemy who wants to see us defeated. There is an enemy who wants to see us confused. Is, there is an enemy who wants to see us sick. You want to see us divorced. You want to see us separated. You want to see our church closed. You want to see us broke. There is an enemy out there. So if we are going to maintain our posture of strength in the kingdom of God, we need to have also a military mindset knowing that this is war. If I'm going to remain strong in the kingdom of God, if I'm going to remain what God has come in to do, I'm not just going to cruise my way to the other side. I have to fight my way to the other side. You know, this reminds me of Apostle Paul, I believe in 2 Timothy 6 12. He said, I fought the good fight of faith. Another word, he said, I've, I've fought the good fight of faith. I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, uh, uh, what did he say? I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. So, what Apostle Paul is telling us, I didn't just cruise to the other side. I didn't just happen to go, you know, I didn't just happen to come and expect Jesus to put a crown over my head. I had to fight a good fight. I had to keep the faith. There will be things that will push you young men to compromise at school, to compromise. There are girls everywhere. There are boys everywhere. And there, there are things on, on your screen that will try to cause you to compromise your purity, things you are watching. But you need to fight a good fight of faith. Why? Because you have your eyes focused on the crown. So the enemy is going to come in many ways. He comes through uh, temptation. He comes through all sorts of ways. But I want you to know that God wants us to keep on standing. God wants us to fight. And the good thing is I've always said about warfare when we're fighting this battle is that we are not fighting for victory, but rather we are fighting from victory. Because remember, the strength is not in us. The strength is in the Lord. So we are strong in him and the power of his might. So when we are saying we are strong, we are just standing in the strength because our eyes are not on us, but our eyes are fixed on what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago.
Glory to God. I'm going to pray. Here's Mama V is coming to release us. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Father, we want to be strong. Today, as we are asking a question, where is our strength? You are our strength. Father, help us to focus on you, keep on trusting you, until that day when you look at our face, you say to us, you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we bless you for what you have done. We bless you what you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen.